Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Roy Gosain. And we are the Oncology Brothers. Today, we're thrilled to have a nationally known researcher and a clinician, Dr. Raina McKay from UC San Diego, to walk us through the current standard of care for prostate cancer. Raina, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you so much, Raina. It was such a pleasure to see you at GU ASCO and now doing this. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Oh, absolutely. So diving right in into the prostate cancer algorithm, focusing on the localized disease. So I know that uh, radiation and surgery play a huge role here. Where do medical oncology take place and how, how do we stand here with that? You know, honestly, for localized disease, low risk localized disease, even active surveillance has become a, a much more common practice for those Gleason 6 tumors with low PSA and disease confined to the prostate. And, you know, sometimes medical oncologists are not involved. Sometimes they can be involved. Certainly in my practice, I see a fair bit of individuals as as you're sort of the, the um, you know, even broker uh, when it comes to this space. Sometimes individuals just want an opinion about their, their risk, their risk of a pro progression in uh, somewhat not through the eyes of a surgeon and not through the eyes of a radiation oncologist. And I think we can definitely play a role in helping facilitate those early discussions. Raina, you've mentioned Gleason 6. There's been a lot of talk saying, should we even call that cancer? But not just low risk, a lot of these patients are getting upstaged because of our staging modalities, which brings up the idea of PSMA, PET-CT. How are you using this and are you using this to stage all your patients up front? Very, very good question. And actually at, at GU ASCO this past weekend, there was a heated discussion about whether we should actually change the nomenclature um, <laughs> around uh, grade group one or Gleason six uh, cancer. And um, I, I don't think I don't think we have a, a, a overwhelming yes, we're going to change. But I, I know the discussion will continue to be had. Um, with regards to utilization of PSMA PET across the spectrum of prostate cancer disease states, for those individuals that have low risk disease or favorable intermediate, I'm I'm not really utilizing PSMA PET. There's really no role for, um, you know, uh, use of this modality. I mean, the main reason to be getting this is to assess for occult metastases and the likely of likelihood of occult metastases in the low intermediate risk favorable population, it, it's it's exceedingly, exceedingly rare. And you're more apt to find false positives that you're chasing your tail around than anything that's clinically meaningful. Thanks. Now, focusing on the high risk, where we know that abiraterone in combination with radiation and ATT is approved, what is the exact patient population that you utilize abiraterone role here? So very good question. Um, so this data about ADT escalation uh, for those very high risk patients stem from Stampede. And you know the, this cohort of patients is not just your classic NCCN high risk, but patients had to have a Gleason 8, 9, 10 cancer, T3 disease, um, or a PSA uh, greater than 40, and they needed to meet two out of those three criteria. Um, there was no PSMA PET imaging at the time that patients were enrolled onto Stampede with this criteria, but a large subset of these individuals did, in fact, have occult metastatic disease. So, you know, the the Abbey for high risk, it's it's like Abbey for like super, it's like Stampede high risk, very high risk, uh, not just NCCN. Um, you know, for those, yeah, and, and for those people that are undergoing surgery, um, you know, should a man decide that they don't want upfront radiation, they want surgery up front, that is uh, potentially a modality that can be utilized, though the rates of biochemical recurrence um, following surgery for individuals with high-risk disease is certainly, um, you know, higher. And so that's where we employ salvage radiation strategies with or without ADT. Now, moving right along, particularly in the PSA relapse or biochemical recurrence, now we have enzalutamide with recent approval as well. So how does that all tie in based on the algorithm here, Raina? It's a very good question. <laughs> I think the, the space of biochemical recurrent disease, it's like the wild, wild west of prostate cancer because <laughs> okay. there's so many different things that people can do. And um, especially now with uh, PSMA PET imaging, it's it's just added this additional layer of complexity and 
it's um, resulting in treatment decisions that aren't necessarily predicated on level one evidence, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of heterogeneity, like from the, you could watch an individual if they've got a low PSA and slow PSA doubling time. If, um, you know, uh, if they've had surgery and they're under, and they've recurred, they can obviously get local radiation. But, you know, if somebody has a PSMA PET scan and they have spot metastases where you we're seeing just radiation to the metastases without ADT, we're seeing radiation to the metastases with ADT. Um, you know, there's also the data from Embark of escalated ADT for those high risk individuals adding ENZA to ADT. There's ENZA monotherapy that was also looked at in that trial. trial. So we actually, there's a wide spectrum of all, a ton of different options that can potentially be employed. And I think a lot of what actually ends up happening is, is really critical on that shared decision making that happens with the patient. Every patient has, you know, different goals and uh, risk benefit kind of, um, you know, scale that they're weighing about the their approach to their prostate cancer. And also understanding the patient's comorbidities, their age, their potential life expectancy, because, you know, many people with biochemical, biochemical recurrent disease, the majority of them don't die of prostate cancer. So I think understanding that helps drive what to do and how aggressive to be. And again, Rena, as a community oncologist, all this is so overwhelming, but it is so good to see that there are so many more options now, but it is about the patient that's right in front of us. What's their need? What's important to them when it comes to mm -hmm. quality of life? And what are the risk versus benefits that we're doing with either combination or single agent ADT or ENZA here? Reina, any particular scenario where you feel comfortable with intermittent ADT and also any scenario where you prefer Reloglex over other ADT formulations? So very good question. So in the localized setting, it, the, the question isn't really about intermittent ADT. You know, for people that present with localized disease that's potentially curable, we're treating them with curative intent, with definitive therapy for a finite period of time, and then they're going to stop. And I don't want to have to say I'm going to retreat you because I want you to be cured. So I think in the context of localized definitive therapy, the intermittent question doesn't so much come up. It's It's for those people that are recurrent that don't have the option of cure where we talk about intermittent. Now, with regards to relagolics, this is a oral GnRH um, antagonist that results in um, more dramatic uh, uh, testosterone declines up front um, and sustained castration. Um, there's also a more rapid time to T recovery after discontinuation of relagolics, and there's some um, you know, post hoc analyses around cardiovascular events that may suggest there could be a more favorable cardiovascular profile with relagolics, so that is, you know, post hoc, uh, so you have to take it for what it's worth. Where I like using relagolics is in situations where I am, um, I am going to intend to give the patient an off period, um, because when they're off therapy, you want them to recover their tea and, and feel well um, and have improved quality of life. Or in, in somebody, even though the data is post hoc, if there are significant cardiovascular risk factors and they really need one ADT, then I may lean towards that agent. You know, it's perfect for the short course ADT, you know, four to six months of ADT, four to six months, like you're you're done, you give their therapy and and that's it. And particularly uh, for M1 CSPC, if these patients are presenting now with low tumor burden and then the doubling time is not a concern, do you see any role of docetaxel uh, or making these patients go through such a uh, regimented approach there? Yeah, very good question. I think first I will say the studies that looked at intensified therapy for metastatic disease, these patients were metastatic by conventional imaging. So what we're not talking about somebody who had right. a PSMA PET and has has one or two spots or even four or five spots on PSMA PET, but they're kind of regular CT scan and bone scans negative. Those people were not captured on those studies. But for people who are overtly metastatic on routine imaging, um, you know, we've dichotomized by volume of disease, um, high and low volume, utilizing the modified charted criteria with you know, four or more bone mets and presence or absence of, of visceral metastases. And then also looked at timing of onset of metastatic disease. Do they have uh, synchronous or metachronous disease? 
and you you can kind of generate four buckets, if you will. Um, you know, if they're you know high volume metachronous synchronous, low volume metachronous synchronous, and and generally I think for the high volume synchronous patients, those are the patients that I think in my clinical practice I'm really escalating with triple therapy, ADT, ARSI, docetaxel. Those are the patients that have um, you know the worst prognosis um, and probably need escalated therapy. I think for on the opposite end of the spectrum is your you know, low risk metachronous patient who, you know, could certainly get by with ADT and an ARSI without any need for docetaxel. And, you know, when we think about the effect size of the ARSI in those low volume metachronous, you know, it, it's smaller because their risk right. is lower. So um, uh, that's sort of how I like to think about integrating docetaxel in the MHSPC setting. And this is also the setting, we've not touched upon this just yet, but looking for germline or other somatic mutations is going to be helpful because how are you going to incorporate the PARP inhibitors given that we can use them as single agents and now also as combination? Yeah, very good question. I think in my practice, you know, I do germline testing for patients with, um, you know, uh, locally advanced uh, high risk disease, um, not even metastatic. And then anybody that's metastatic, when I first know that they're metastatic, they get tested because I like to plan ahead and know what, um, how I'm going to potentially tailor their therapy. And also it helps inform discussions around prognosis and cas cascade testing for family members. So, um, you know, at the present time, we there is no role for PARP inhibitors in the um, hormone sensitive setting, though there are studies um, uh, that are currently being conducted in selected patients evaluating that, but we don't have data at the present time for how to in integrate. I think largely the data is utilized to help strategize treatment options in the CRPC setting, the castration resistant setting. And I think as we talk about that setting, we have data from three studies of PARP inhibitors in combination with ARSIs. Um, you know, some of the limitations of these studies were that they were predominantly done in patients who had received ADT alone in the MHSPC setting. And we know that in clinical practice now, that population, though it does still continue to exist, it's decreasing as people are getting escalated in the MHSPC setting. So certainly um, the labels differ based off of uh, the trials that were done, whether it's BRCA1, 2 mutated or just a panel of HRR genes, but that certainly can be a consideration. And, and the great thing is there's actually a lot of other drugs too. You know, if they haven't seen DOSI, that's an option. Um, you know, now we've got, uh, you know, uh, uh, Pluvicto, uh, Lutetium, PSMA, um, you know, monotherapy, PARP, Cabazitaxel, Radium-223. Cipulusal T can also be utilized, though in clinical practice it's utilizing, it's being utilized a lot lower. I think in my clinical practice where I integrate CIP-T is in patients who are having some PSA progression on primary hormone therapy. Um, they're otherwise doing well. You can kind of get in their sip tea over a six to eight week period and then just go on to the next thing, you know. And going to your point about testing for germline, I think doing it much earlier on, as you were stating, I think it just comforts patients and their families that if it is positive, it opens up more doors for treatment later. So that's a bit comforting. Um, now, Reina, outside of BRCA or homologous uh, repair, gene mutations, use of NGS, how do you utilize to guide your treatment or even management, especially when you have TP53 or P10 or RB loss present? Does that dictate you getting scans sooner at all? Yeah, no, very, very good question. I think there's been excellent work that has been done looking at these, um, you know, almost aggressive variant prostate cancer if there's the presence of one of the three uh, tumor suppressor gene uh, uh, genes that are altered. You know, we know that those patients that have such genes, particularly RB loss or RB alterations, they are uh, have more aggressive disease. Um, you know, maybe in those individuals, you're going to want to be integrating chemotherapy. Those tumors sometimes tend to be a little bit more androgen independent or insensitive. Um, so it does certainly help with. Um, you know, strategizing around therapy. I think it's also good to know, you know, their mixed status. We know those tumors can be pretty aggressive. Um, you know, one to two percent of prostate cancer tumors are MSI high or have high TMB, which could open up the door for uh, pembrolizumab. I think one of the most provocative questions around pembrolizumab is if you know somebody's MSI high, do you wait 
till they get CRPC before you integrate Pembro. I mean, I literally just saw somebody yesterday in clinic who um, who has um, a you know de novo metastatic disease. Uh, they're high high volume, um, and you know the question is, you know, do we do you escalate with Pembro in the MHSPC setting? We we don't yet have data, but it, it's you know, we need to figure out answers to these questions because these are the things that come up in real life practice. Like you just, right, you right. see that genomic alteration, you're like, why am I waiting until they progress, you know? So in this case, Rena, what are you doing for this patient? Are you using Pembro up front or are you waiting for it? I'm waiting and using um, ADT uh, uh, with abiraterone and docetaxel um, as well. And, um, uh, you know, waiting for the Pembro at a later time point. but you know, I think in the absence of data, I, I am hesitant to use it in combination with quad therapy. You know what I mean? But yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And well, you know, it's interesting because especially how amazing responsiveness we've seen in other tumors, when especially for MSI high patient population. And just to go, it's just to how important it is to uh, say that NGS testing is extremely important. Until unless we do it, uh, we would not find out about any of this. And just to stem off from that point, Reina, are you doing NGS testing on progression at all? I know that we were at fellows forum, there was a paper presented by one of the fellows who said there is use, but what are you doing in your clinical setting? I I do like to try to do NGS testing periodically throughout the patient's disease course. A lot of times their first test is done off of a prostate biopsy, may not necessarily reflect what's actually happening with the patient now, and and uh, is usually done in a treat, in, in, on tissue that's been not exposed to any drugs or therapies. And so if there are problems with doing a repeat biopsy, the patient's got bone predominant disease, lymph nodes really small, I do integrate ctDNA testing, though you will sometimes lose uh, the ability to detect certain alterations, particularly gene losses, which aren't really captured well on ctDNA tests. And now, you know, there's other drugs being developed. Sorry to interrupt. There's other drugs being developed, you know, AR degraders that are being developed in AR mutated uh, tumors. There's, um, you know, uh, AKT inhibitors, there's other different classes of drugs, uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors. There's, so I think there's a lot of potential for additional targeted therapy strategies that could inform eligibility for clinical trials for patients. So I always try to ensure I have an updated test. And again, we're not going to go too deep into this topic, but using ctDNA to even monitor the disease status is something that we've used in colon cancer. A lot of different platforms are pushing serial ctDNA to monitor this, not standard of care. But what we have available right now as a tool, scans. When yeah. these patients have uptrending PSA, Reina, are you getting PSMA, PET-CT every time you see that? Or how are you restaging these patients? No, very good question. Um, I don't necessarily restage with PSMA PET at every imaging juncture. Um, I do think it's important to be continuously staging patients in, um, uh, especially in the castration resistance setting, or I should say scanning, because their stage isn't really going to change. But um, they're getting those scans done. Um, you know, sometimes I see all too often that you know, treatment decisions are only happening based off of PSA fluctuations alone. And a patient may go one or two or three years in the hormone resistance setting without a single scan. And all decisions were based off of fluctuations on PSA. And I think that is doing the patients a disservice because I think that could potentially result in stopping a therapy where there could be clinical benefit um, just because of a PSA rise. And, and we know in the hormone resistance setting, PSA is not as informative, um, like radium-223, for example, PSA, PSA doesn't help us at all with assessing response, nor for CYP-T, um, you know, so I think, I, I don't think PSA is the whole story. I think it's the triad of PSA, clinical symptoms, and imaging that helps a clinician integrate that data to decide, do I stop therapy or not? It's not just any one parameter. There's a, you know, integrated thought analysis that happens about stopping or starting a new drug, you know? Yeah, no, there's so much more to just staring at one number, <laughs> the clinical picture, the scans, and again, coming back to patient-centered care. We've talked about PSA as a marker. Is that a reliable marker when you're giving Plavictor or Letitian PSMA? Actually, 
where are you using Letitia and PSMA and what lines? And then are you monitoring PSA or are you waiting for them to complete four to six cycles to repeat scans? A no, very good question. So I think um, all, everybody is really post an ARSI. Sometimes I will use it concurrently with an ARSI right now, predominantly in the post chemotherapy setting, though we know that there's many patients who don't want to do chemotherapy or are not eligible for chemotherapy. And so in those scenarios, you can consider doing it pre chemotherapy. Um, you know, I think in my practice, I tend to follow PSA with each cycle um, every six weeks. Um, I do like to get midway scans. Um, if they're doing great, I'll do it after three cycles. If the PSA isn't coming down as fast as I like or maybe rising, I'll do it after two cycles just to gaze what's actually going on. Um, but I think following people with PSMA PET, even when they're doing um, uh, lutetia and PSMA, can be challenging because there may be changes in SUV and, and other things that we just don't really know what it means. And um, we've certainly seen flare documented on bone scan and CT scan in the, in the context of effective other therapies. And we have not yet characterized if that exists with PSMA PET or, um, you know, uh, you know, if there were to be some sort of flare response or increase in SUV that then resolves. So I think I'm sensitive to kind of uh, making decisions where we don't really have a lot of data. So just so that I get the sequence right, you usually expose them to docetaxel, then consider lutetium um, PSMA, and then come to cabazitaxel? Um, so very good question. I think, yes, I think initially, I think the placement of cabazitaxel in the context of lutetium hasn't really been totally spelled out. I think in some people who are having sort of rapid progression or visceral metastases, I may do cabazitaxel first um, mm -hmm. over doing, um, you know, lutetium, depending on what I know about their disease. Um, so I think it does vary based off of clinical symptoms. Wow, with this ever-changing field, there's so much to always unpack. Thank you so much, Raina, for taking the time to share your thoughts on this treatment algorithm of prostate cancer with us today. For our listeners, let's have a quick recap. In this discussion today with Dr. Raina McKay from UCSD, we focused on her treatment approach to prostate cancer. We have covered treatment options for localized disease, including the role of abiraterone in high-risk patients, along with radiation involvement and surgical involvement. During this discussion, we also had a chance to reiterate the importance of testing for germline and somatic mutations. PARPET inhibitors in selected patients continue to play a big role. In castration resistance settings, we focused on systemic treatment options, including docetaxel, cabazitaxel, and lutetium PSMA being available for our patients today. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure to check out our urothelial cancer and RCC treatment algorithm discussion as well. We are the Oncology Brothers.